Many people don't know that Darwin did not attempt to answer the question of the origin of life. He had a brief speculation that he offered about it in a, in a uh, letter to a friend, Joseph Hooker, about life emerging from some simpler chemicals in a what he called a warm little pond. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us on the Good Fight Radio Show. And on today's episode, we have a special, special guest. And a lot of that comes from my own testimony. Because back in 2008, my now brother in Christ, Adam Rungren, took me to see a documentary titled Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. And now at the time, I was in college. I was more of a newfound atheist. And I had believed that a lot of those in the scientific community had the answers to the origin of the universe that might have bothered me, but they would have those answers. So I had appealed to that authority whenever I had questions regarding those origins. But what Expelled No Intelligence Allowed did was expose not only the blackballing that was going on towards the professors who posited intelligent design, but they even were blackballing and maligning those professors who even published other people's works regarding intelligent design. Specifically, the one who I noticed was poking at the scientific community's hornet's nest was none other than Dr. Stephen C. Meyer. And now, Dr. Meyer is a wonderful, wonderful author who's written book written books such as the Signature in the Cell, Darwin's Doubt, and his latest book, The Return of the God Hypothesis. And these books are mightily important for us to understand some of the wonderful evidences that God has let us have, really, in his providence and in his love, to show us his handiwork, to show us who he is. So I am beyond excited to welcome to the show... Dr. Stephen C. Meyer, welcome to the Good Fight Radio Show. Uh, thanks for having me on, Chad. Well, you know, as I said, and I hadn't even told you this in intro, I am excited to have you because personally, your work had an amazing effect on me because I do believe watching that film in 2008 uh, was just before I came to Christ in 2009, and it really did remove a lot of obstacles because I had trusted that when it came to the scientific community, Maybe I didn't understand, but, you know, if I appealed to that authority, they would know how to answer the reason for, you know, the origin of the universe, how it all started, abiogenesis, something. And when I watched that film, I realized that their answers were no good. And you were a big reason for that. Well, a lot of people have th that same assumption that the uh, scientific community has the, uh, uh, the questions of biological origins in particular all sewn up. But when you get into the the evidence, uh, it turns out that it's no such no no such situation prevails. Uh, in particular, with the question, the vexing question of the origin of the first life. Many people don't know that Darwin uh, did not attempt to answer the question of the origin of life. He had a brief speculation that he offered about it in a, in a uh, letter to a friend, Joseph Hooker, about life emerging from some simpler chemicals in a what he called a warm little pond. Uh, but in 160 some odd years since Darwin's publication of The Origin of the Species, scientists are no uh, closer to understanding how life would have evolved via an undirected uh, chemical evolutionary process, where chemical evolution refers to the process of uh, life coming from non-life, from simpler non-living chemicals. And uh, that was one of the things that was discussed in the, in the film expelled and there was a, of course a telling interview at the end where ben stein the the the, the host of the the, the documentary uh, got uh, richard dawkins to acknowledge that uh, neither he nor anyone else knew how life had arisen by an undirected chemical evolutionary process and instead dawkins actually speculated that yeah there may well be a signature of intelligence inside life and the, and then he posited that Perhaps life had been seeded here on an, from another planet by an intelligent designer of a of an extraterrestrial kind. So it was, it was a surprising twist at the end of the film, where even the world's most uh, uh, prominent scientific atheist uh, acknowledged that there may be evidence of intelligent design, but not a, a design he was willing to consider 
might have come from uh, a, 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 an ultimate creator. Yeah, and I have to be honest, it's funny you bring that one up because specifically that and people talking about stuff on the backs of crystals in that film and whatnot, I I think it was that one, that specific no non-weird answer that for me was kind of a, a kick in the gut because I was like, man, I thought at least they would have some answers to this and you know, having aliens drop off some goo or something, you know, I just thought this was just not what I was expecting. And I, I thought that was really interesting. And if you guys haven't checked out the film, we'll put a link in the description. I would love for you guys to check it out um, because people were publishing your work and then they were getting, I mean, they were getting maligned. Uh, there were some some tenure problems. Could you just go into that a little bit before we talk about your well, new book? Yeah, sure. The, the, the beginning of the film uh, was, a, was t telling the story of uh, five scientists who had been effectively expelled from the academy because they had come to perceive that there was evidence of design, of intelligent design in life and the universe. And one of the, 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 the stories that Ben Stein uh, told intersected with some of my work in the following way. Uh, I, I published uh, an article, a peer-reviewed article, advancing the theory of intelligent design in 2004 at uh, a journal called the Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington, which was the uh, technical journal of the Smithsonian Institution. And while nothing happened to me, the editor who allowed the paper to go through peer review and then subsequently published it upon receiving favorable peer review reports was, uh, uh, was persecuted in a fairly aggressive way. His name is Richard Sternberg. He has two earned PhDs in biology, one in mathematical biology. He's quite a genius. He had, at that point, 40 peer-reviewed papers. I don't know how many he has now. Uh, but uh, the, af after the, the paper was published, the, the, the museum started receiving angry letters from subscribers to the journal. And an emergency meeting was convened by the, uh, organ the, the organization that oversaw the publication of the journal. And the president of the, that organization told uh, Dr. Sternberg that he should not come to the meeting, even though he was the editor of the journal, because tempers were running so high he couldn't guarantee his personal safety. Eventually, he was uh, uh, transferred out from under the of a, of a, a friendly colleague. He was denied access to his office, his scientific samples, his keys were taken away, and he was placed in an office next to an administrator where they could, quote, keep an eye on him. And on a parallel track, the people began to, from the museum, apparently, we're not exactly sure, but people started to make inquiries with the National Institutes of Health, where he held a, a, a dual appointment. And, and we're trying to get him fired. And it took the intervention of a U.S. senator to protect his job there, even though that wasn't even the, the entity that was had published the journal. journal. Uh, so it was really a horrific experience. And, and finally, uh, the, it was the, the, the hostility there was, was such that uh, he ended up leaving the, the Smithsonian Institution altogether. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because when I was in college, that first semester after becoming a believer, I had taken an English course, and the required reading, the first two readings were Darwin and then Stephen Jay Gould. And so those were the first two readings, and we were then required to give a, a final paper, and on the final paper, we had to get it approved by him because he didn't want to debate abortion and so forth. Uh, and so I actually said, I want to debate on intelligent design, and then I, he's like, I don't know. I said, hey, here's the video, and I gave him expelled, no intelligence allowed, and he said, you know what? And I think it, it kind of played because he's a college professor and he didn't like the fact that people were getting blackballed, even though he disagreed with them. And he let me write the paper. And then the next semester, he actually told a friend of mine, he's like, yeah, I think there is uh, an intelligent designer behind all this. So there was some some good. Oh, interesting. In you actually semester. persuaded your professor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With my first well, paper I mean, in college. Good, good for him for at least being open to the debate. That's that's a big part of academic freedom. And the story of the expelled began with the story of the abridgment of the academic freedom of some very prominent scientists. And in the case of Sternberg, um, 
you know, he wasn't even the author of the paper. And there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about the case. And the writer there said, you know, Sternberg wasn't even the heretic. It was that guy Meyer out there in Seattle <laughs> at the Discovery Institute. It was so uh, anyway, yeah, there, there have been many such cases like that. But I think when you when you see that type of behavior among scientists, it's actually a, it's actually a tell. And it's a tell of weakness, of intellectual insecurity. You, you don't need to resort to those tactics if you're confident of your case. And as we've made the case, first against uh, chemical evolutionary theory and indeed biological evolutionary theory, that is neo-Darwinism, and then subsequently the positive case for intelligent design, more and more scientists have been persuaded by the arguments that we've made. But there has been a kind of rear guard action among people in the scientific establishment. Well, in, I wouldn't say the scientific establishment. It's the, it's the evolutionary establishment. It's mm. the Darwinian establishment. And they've tried to shut down the debate and made it very difficult for people who are raising questions about what is now a 160-year-old theory um, from, coming, from, from coming to the surface. But I, I'm, you know, I think the situation has changed a lot since 2004 when I published that paper. Um, and uh, just the, the network of scientists who are interested in intelligent design, the evidence for intelligent design, and the way in which the concept of design can be used as a uh, what's called a heuristic in science, a guide to further research. And uh, we have scientists now all over the world, some of uh, whose research were substitute, others are who are doing this independently, who are... <clears throat> finding more and more evidence of design and biology in particular, but also using the concept of intelligent design to make predictions about what one ought to find when, you, when, when someone looks at life. And one of the, the first key predictions, in fact, one that was made by Richard Sternberg very early on, uh, was the idea that the junk DNA, the um, so-called, uh, the, the so-called, the DNA that performs no function as far as building proteins, uh, isn't junk, that it does perform important functions. And that has now been uh, verified by some, some very important research that was published in 2011 out of something called the ENCODE project. So we, those of us who were sympathetic to design or open to the, to the possibility of it thought, well, maybe these big sections of the genome that aren't coding for proteins are still doing something important, uh, which is what we'd expect if life had been intelligently designed. Lo and behold, those non-coding regions of the genome are functioning much like an operating system in a computer that is coordinating the timing and the expression of the data files that do code for proteins. So it's what we've what, what's been discovered is that the the genome is a uh, uh, part of a hierarchical uh, information processing system that is just mind blowing in its complexity, and uh, it's reminiscent of of things that we have in our own high tech digital world that our own software and hardware engineers design. But it's much more sophisticated than that. So um, <clears throat> we're seeing design at every level of life. And it, that's a great way to look at life and a great, great way to study it from the assumption of evidence of, of that design. So that's, it's kind of a twofold thing. A good scientific research program will have an argument for a perspective. But then once that perspective is reasonably well established in the minds of at least some scientists, then those scientists use that to guide further research. And we're into that stage of the research program now. And I think that's very exciting. No, that is really exciting to hear, and I, and I love for people to hear that. And, you know, you were also the author of two other books, Signature in the Cell and then Darwin's Doubt as well. And would you say when it comes to the return of the God hypothesis that this one right here kind of, I don't know, I think it plays really well with those other two as well. Well, it was intended to build off of the argument that I made in the first two books. And you mentioned the, or I, maybe I brought it up, the alien designer hypothesis of Richard <laughs> Dawkins. Um, I think he now would, would disavow that. I think he was, uh, he felt that, uh, he, he, he was sorry he got into that, I think would be fair to say. <laughs> but there have been scientists going back to Francis Crick and Fred Hoyle, very prominent scientists who have proposed the idea that, um, Yes, uh, there is evidence of design in life, but it must have come from some sort of intelligence within the cosmos, a kind of uh, uh, um, imminent intelligence, uh, an alien being of some kind. Um, and, uh, and so in the first book, I argued for intelligent design without attempting to settle the question or argue for one perspective or another about, the, about 
who the designing agent might be. Is an imminent intelligence within the cosmos? That's a logical possibility, not one that I'm favorable to, but it's a logical possibility. Another possibility is that the design, the designer responsible for life and the universe is a transcendent intelligence, in other words, God. And so uh, I, in the new book, I decided to address this question of the identity of the designing intelligence. I'd had lots of uh, uh, readers ask me, well, who do you think the designer is and what can science tell us about that question? So, um, so that's, that's kind of where I picked up the, the discussion in the new book, Return of the God Hypothesis, where I made a case for not just a designing intelligence of some kind, but rather a designing intelligence who has the attributes that Jews and Christians and other traditional theists have long ascribed or associated with the concept of God, transcendence, uh, intelligence, and therefore uh, we're talking about a personal entity, not a not an impersonal force, and uh, and also an entity that is capable and willing to act within the universe long after the beginning of the universe. So not a deistic creator either. You know, in, in the book you talk about this X factor in terms of the scientific explosion in Europe, and you talk about some differences, and maybe you explain to the audience. Maybe some of the differences when it comes to the God of the Hebrew Bible versus maybe even, you know, not not just other gods, but also maybe Platonic or Epicurean philosophy as well. Well, I, I the book, in addition to addressing this question of the um, uh, identity of the designing intelligence responsible for life in the universe, the book also tells a story. And that is the story of Western science, that it arose in a decidedly Judeo-Christian milieu or context in Western Europe. And it did so for specifically Judeo-Christian, indeed, even biblical reasons. And you can see that in the metaphors that the early scientists used to describe nature. They talked about nature as a book, uh, contrasting it with the book of uh, Scripture, that just as God had re revealed himself in Scripture, he also reveals himself in nature and that nature was intelligible uh, as a book because it had been uh, uh, designed by a rational intellect, namely God, who uh, built rationality, design, and order into the universe. And we could understand it, it therefore it was intelligible to us because it had, it, uh, he made our minds in his image with, and gifted our minds with the same rationality that he himself had, and which is reflected in the design of the universe itself. Uh, the early scientists also talked about the, the, the nature was lawful, that it, it, the concept of the laws of nature was unique to the period of the scientific revolution. And it, it was, a, as one historian of science says, it was a juridical metaphor of theological origins. The idea was that there was law-like order in the universe because there was a lawgiver and someone who sustained those laws, again, namely God. And so the origins of modern science are decidedly Judeo-Christian. They have there, there's a there are presuppositions about nature and about the nature of God that makes science possible. And I explain that in these first few chapters of the book, but then also tell the story of how that perspective was lost during the, the 19th century, largely because of theories of origin that were proposed that that uh, essentially is one. <clears throat> As the story goes with one scientist that uh, he said uh, he had no need of that hypothesis and that, that uh, the origin of the solar system, the origin of the great geological features on planet Earth, the origin of uh, life and new life forms could all be explained as the result of unguided, undirected natural processes such that um, the simplest overall worldview perspective was that of naturalism. Nature was eternal and self-existent and could account for uh, and and self-organizing so that everything could arise from prior self-existent matter and energy that had been eternally here. So uh, that perspective kind of came to dominate by the end of the 19th century and into the early 20th century. And uh, then the last part of the book uh, discusses three big discoveries that are challenging that perspective of scientific naturalism or scientific materialism. And... Uh, causing, I think, uh, a return of the first intelligent design, but also uh, a specific kind of a design hypothesis, namely a God hypothesis. 
No, I I love that about the book. And in the just the first couple chapters, you really do go into detail about where the origins of this science versus God, science versus faith kind of debate. Because, you know, if I'm out on the streets and I want to share the gospel with someone, a lot of times the first thing I hear, oh, I believe in science. And then you have to ask, what, what does that even mean? Uh, well, you believe in God, I believe in science. And I'm like, well, I believe in good science, <laughs> you know? But maybe maybe go into with the audience a little bit about just some of the history of this idea of God being against science and science being against God and so forth. Right. Well, that's really a late 19th century invention of certain uh, revisionist historians. Uh, because, And I think many contemporary historians of science, I, I would say most contemporary historians of science who study the period of the scientific revolution, realize that the science started as a theological project. It was an attempt to reveal as one historian of science, Rodney Stark, has put it in the title of a famous book, the, the, For the Glory of God. Science was being pursued, or what was then called natural philosophy, was being pursued as a way of revealing the handiwork of God. And this was implicit in Newton's great work, the Principia. He was trying to reveal the mathematical principles of the universe that he believed were an expression of, 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 of divine action, of the way God was ordering the universe on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. So the idea that science and religion, or still less even science and uh, Christian religion or the Jewish faith, were are in some way at odds with one another, is something that was um, uh, really invented by historians of the late 19th century. Now, they were writing at a time when there was tension between science and faith, and that came about largely because of uh, Darwin's uh, theory of uh, the um, origin of species by natural selection and the interpretation of um, that work as being something that was supporting the idea that there was no design in nature. Uh, which was also, I think, what Darwin intended uh, to convey. Uh, so there was a tension between that theory and, and, a, and a theological perspective, but that was by no means the overriding uh, perspective uh, or, or, or the overriding way of characterizing the relationship between science and faith over the, the preceding centuries. And as I show in the book, uh, there may be good reasons to doubt the Darwinian account of the origin of life and especially its its denial of design. So um, so uh, this is I, I don't think there is an inherent conflict between science and faith, but there were there were prominent voices in the late nineteenth century who conveyed that idea. and that that perspective is obviously still with us. Many of the popularizers of science today, when whether we think about Neil uh, deGrasse Tyson or, Bill Nye, the science guy, or especially the aggressive new atheists such as uh, Lawrence Krauss and Richard Dawkins have all conveyed the idea that science properly understood their mind's belief in God and uh, therefore is not a belief that rational people really should hold. Um, but that's part was also part of the reason that I wrote the book. I wanted to show that the exact opposite tr is true, that the great discoveries of the 20th and 21st century uh, centuries about especially biological and physical and cosmological origins definitely do support, uh, they don't undermine belief in God. They're not merely neutral. I think they have decidedly theistic implications. That is, they support the idea of, a, of an intelligent and transcendent creator. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned Lawrence Krauss right there, and right at the very beginning of the book, I believe it's in the prologue, you talk about how you were set to debate him, but something interesting actually was going on with you specifically when you're attempting to debate a, a very heady and a, an important topic with him. Maybe if you can give a, a little hint on there and, and let our readers know what was going on, and I think that probably helped you. Would you agree, write this Well, book there was a well. silver lining in it, but I had a bad night at, at the <laughs> University of Toronto <laughs> yeah. a few years ago when I was set to debate Lawrence Krauss and a prominent theistic evolutionist named Dennis Lamoureux. It was a sort of a three-way way conversation, but it was clearly a debate, and each each person got to make an opening statement, and, and then there was to be a discussion afterwards among the three of us, and about 18 minutes into my opening statement, I started to develop a migraine, and... Um, Bright lights had been a trigger for me, but I never had one in front of a live audience like that. And uh, I've, what happens to me with migraines, or did, I'm, 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 I'm fortunately in a much better place with that, having gotten some good neurological advice and taking some 
uh, magnesium supplements that have been very effective for me at least. Mm, um, in any case, I um, found that I, I was starting to have trouble reading my slides. It was a PowerPoint presentation. And then I was having trouble um, pulling words and my voice began to echo in my head. And, um, and so it was, it was just sort of very disorienting. And it was a 25 minute opening statement. And I, I slowed down and kind of got through the rest of it by using really simple uh, phrases and just, just did the best I could. And a, a very kind uh, Canadian doctor who had been uh, shepherding me since he, pick, picking me up at the airport before the debate took me to a dark room and covered my eyes. And uh, when after the third person had made his opening statement, uh, asked, to, you know, do you want to try to do the discussion? I did the best I could. At the very end, the, some of the symptoms started to diminish, and the uh, moderator asked us each to sum up our positions. And so I, um, uh, being a bit short for words, uh, found that I you know, needed to say something quite succinct, and I m noted that there were three big discoveries that had been made in the last uh, 100 years or so that, to me, seemed to support theism the topic of the debate was what lies behind it all and i had come hoping not just to talk about intelligent design but also this question of the identity of the designing intelligence kraus was known for work on or for a book that he'd written called universe from nothing which is a popularization of something called quantum cosmology which has been used as a kind of uh, materialistic account of the origin of the universe itself a, a, an account that um is meant to refute the cosmological argument for the existence of God and uh, argue that, you know, that uh, the universe could well have popped into existence from literal, literally nothing uh, save the, the laws of physics that allow for that possibility. And so I had come prepared to discuss that with him. But um, in the end, with the migraine and the way the debate ended up going, it mainly was it ended up being a discussion of the opening statement that I made about the case for intelligent design and biology. In any case, at the end of the debate, we were asked to sum up our positions. And I said, well, you know, I think there, there are three big discoveries that have been made that, to me, point to God as the reality behind everything that I think support what's called classical theism. And the discoveries are that, first, the universe had a beginning. Second, the universe has been finely tuned against all odds and for no apparent underlying physical reason for the possibility of life from the very beginning of the universe. And thirdly, that the um, that inside even the simplest living cells, we have found evidence of complex digital nano digital and nanotechnology information in present in the DNA molecule. And given what we know about the origin of information always coming from an intelligent source, that suggests to me a master programmer for life. And so I summarized these three big discoveries very briefly at the end of the debate and found that, and then I got a lot of email from people who of course felt badly for me. having a migraine in such a high profile setting and that sort of thing. But many of them said the one thing that really stood out to me about the substance of the debate was your closing statement about those three big discoveries. And that seemed, so several people said that seemed very compelling to them and they'd like to know more. And so I thought, it might be time to write the book about the identity <laughs> of the designing intelligence and discuss those three big discoveries. And in the process, of course, if you've read, the, uh, take on this idea of quantum cosmology and that the universe might have uh, arisen from nothing at all but the laws of physics and show that even if that's true, even if the quantum cosmological account of the origin of the universe is correct, it too has uh, tacit theistic implications. It seems in a subtle, it, it also supports in a perhaps subtle way, the reality of God. Just briefly on that point, if life or if the universe arose from pre-existing laws of physics, where laws of physics are mathematical descriptions of how nature in this case will work, because there's not a natural world yet, that's a very strange kind of thing to assert because the laws of physics being purely mathematical are therefore conceptual. And concepts and mathematical ideas only in our experience exist in minds. And so as one of the great quantum cosmologists, uh, Alexander Vilenkin has, has pointed out if, or has asked, he says, if, if we're saying that the universe came from pre-existing uh, mathematical ideas, does that mean we're saying that, that 
that a mind predated the universe. So anyway, we can get more into that. You know, you mentioned specifically a couple of things that I'd love for you to, I guess you can quickly break them down a little bit, but you talk about these three evidences and that's specifically, or three discoveries, and that is part of the subtitle in the book. And maybe I guess we could start off and just see where it goes, but Let's let's hear some of these uh, some of these you yeah know, absolutely that that's the, out, that's I'd, the I'd exciting part really it's yeah the, amen the evidence <laughs> and the things that have been discovered the first is the discovery well let's start with the the last one first and we'll go backwards but we've talked a little bit about it already because that was the subject of my book signature in the cell and the discovery in modern molecular biology that the small even the smallest and simplest units of life the living cell have within them uh, sophisticated information storing molecules and a complex information storage processing and uh, uh, information storage transmission and processing system. And such that if you want to explain the origin of life, you've got to explain where that information, where the information processing system came from. And this is the inability to explain that system as a result of spontaneous interaction of simpler non-living chemicals has is the reason that there's a complete impasse in origin of life research or studies of chemical abiogenesis um, and that's that's that was the reason that ben stein was able to extract that concession from richard dawkins uh, <laughs> several years ago and that is because really no one does have a, a clue how such a system of information and information processing could have arisen from the interactions of simple non-living chemicals on a prebiotic earth. Um, and what I argue in Signature in the Cell is instead what we know from our experience is that information, especially if we find it in a digital or, or, digital or alphabetic form, always arises from an intelligent source. Uh, our colleague out here, our, our, not our colleague, but our, our local hero, Bill Gates, has said the DNA is like a software program, but much more complex than any we've ever devised. Richard Dawkins himself has acknowledged that the DNA is like a machine code uh, <clears throat> and has recently tweeted that he's been not knocked sideways by <clears throat> his awareness of the uh, complex data processing system that's at work inside this, the, the living cell. And <clears throat> we know from experience that software comes from programmers. And we know more generally that whenever we find information, whether it's in a software program or a hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book or information embedded in a radio signal, Whenever we find information and trace it back to its source, we always come to a mind, not a material process. So the discovery of information at the foundation of life in even the very simplest cells suggests the activity of a designing intelligence in the origin and history of life. And that was the, that was the argument of my book, Signature in the Cell. And I reprised and updated that argument in the new book, uh, a return of the God hypothesis. Uh, so that's one of the big discoveries that we've got digital code inside living organisms uh, directing the construction of the important uh, proteins and protein machinery that all cells need to stay alive. I, I think that's some incredible, just in, it's incredible to me when you hear a lot of the evidence is for, because I do believe a lot of times the argument that people will use is say, oh, you know, the God, the return of the God hypothesis is just the return of the God of the gaps, right? <laughs> And then you're, that's not what you're saying here. No, this is not a God of the gaps argument. A God of the gaps argument is a, a, a colloquial way of describing what logicians call an argument from ignorance. And those sorts of arguments have the following form. Uh, they would have, if say we're trying to explain some effect, call it E, and we find that some cause A is not sufficient to produce the effect E. And then we say, well, Therefore, it must have been cause B, but we know we offer no positive evidence that cause B is capable of, of producing the effect E. That's an argument from ignorance. That's an argument from gaps in our knowledge about what does actually cause the e effect of, of, of interest. The case for intelligent design is not an argument from ignorance. It's an inference to the best explanation where we are attempting to explain a particular effect, namely functional digital information. And we find that any number of proposed 
materialistic explanations for the origin of that information have failed. We know of no materialistic explanation of any kind that's been able to produce large amounts of functional digital information. But we do know of a cause that does routinely produce such an effect, and that cause is intelligence or mind. Again, programmers produce software. We know that things that have the character of software that are um, what in the book I characterize in a technical way as specified or functional information are always the product of intelligent agents. And therefore, we have positive knowledge of the causal efficacy of the cause that we're proposing as an explanation for the information that needs to be explained. Therefore, it's not an argument from ignorance. It's an argument from our knowledge of the relevant cause and effect uh, patterns and processes that we see at work in the world. It's part of our knowledge base that minds can generate information. And therefore, when we find information at the foundation of life, it's a justified inference to conclude that a mind played a role in its origin. Yeah, I, I love the how you explain that as well, because I, I do think as we go through these these next two uh, points that you're going to make as well, it's important for people to see this is evidence. This isn't just, oh, well, we just hope he fills in this gap. You know, this is something entirely different. So what would you say the second great discovery is uh, concerning, you know, what you would point out here in the yeah, Return we're going of the God back, Hypothesis. We're going in reverse order temporally in a way. But um, the second one I would, would say is the, the fine tuning of the universe. It's not only been discovered that um, there's evidence of design in life, but that the universe itself from its very foundation or for, from, its, from the beginning and very soon after has been finely tuned in its basic physical parameters to allow for the possibility of life. The universe appears to be a setup job or a kind of, a, some, some physicists describe it now as the goal, a Goldilocks universe where the basic parameters of physics, like for example, the strength of gravitational attraction could be stronger, could be weaker, but instead it falls within a very narrow window or very narrow tolerance where in uh, the production of carbon is possible and many other features that are necessary for life to exist. Uh, the strength of electromagnetic attraction, the other fundamental forces of physics all fall within very narrow uh, limits that allow life to exist in the universe. The masses of the elementary particles, not too strong, not too, or not, not too heavy, not too, not too light. Uh, the force that causes the expansion of the universe outward from the beginning, something called the cosmological constant, exquisitely fine-tuned to one part in 10 to the 90th power is an accepted uh, uh, value by many, by many physicists. Some physicists hold that the fine-tuning is even more exquisite, more improbable. Um, and uh, just to put that number in, in context, there's only 10 to the 80th elementary particles in the entire universe. So finding... Uh, getting the the uh, fine t the cosmological uh, constant fine tuning correct would be by, by chance would be something uh, uh, would be equivalent to getting a blindfolded person floating in free space uh, able to pick out one marked elementary particle in our universe, but not just in our universe, but in the person would have to find it by chance in 10 billion universes our size. <laughs> so it's an unbelievably exquisite degree of fine tuning. And then finally, I mean, there are many of these parameters, but another one that's very impressive is the fine tuning of the initial arrangement of matter and energy at the very beginning of the universe. It's called the initial entropy fine tuning. And that, that fine tuning is almost beyond computation. It's It's been calculated to be one part in 10 to the 10th power raised again to the 123rd power. It's called a hyper exponential number. So the universe, a life-friendly universe is beyond improbable. It's, it's uh, you, know, you know, English language doesn't quite have that enough uh, <laughs> superlative adjectives to capture the degree of fine tuning. And so many physicists, including Sir Fred Hoyle, a great astrophysicist who was initially an atheist, he opposed the Big Bang Theory on the grounds that he thought it supported a theistic view of creation, um, ended up changing his worldview after discovering some of these key fine-tuning parameters himself, and later said that a, a common sense interpretation of the, of the data suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics 
and chemistry in order to make life possible. Um, and uh, I, I, I like to quip that the uh, I, I think it's fun the way the monkeys always make it into the origins discussion, even if we're talking about the universe. But uh, <laughs> Hoyle is just one of many physicists who have come to see that that the fine tuning seems to support the idea of a fine tuner of intelligent design operating from the very beginning of the universe. Uh, now, there's there is a contrary view uh, that's popular today called the multiverse, and we can discuss that as well. But on its face, the fine tuning is suggested to many physicists. Yes, I, and design. I and I actually had that written down as you were talking to make sure to bring up the the multiverse argument. And one of the things as as hopefully you're listening to Dr. Stephen Meyer here talk about these things. I know for me personally, hearing just how exquisite creation is. I mean, really, it does have an effect on my devotional life. When I read, you know, in Psalm 19, obviously, that the heavens declare the glory of God, I hear those, I hear what you're saying, and it, and it really is hand in glove when, it talk, when we're talking about these things. I, I really think it's, it's beautiful to see God's hand in nature and recognize that he is the one who created us. And I, I will bring out the multiverse question, because I, I was out in Israel sharing the gospel on the streets, and this got thrown at me as well as we're talking. Well, there could be a multiverse as if this, you know, it just it's the trump card to everything you just explained. So how would you answer that, Dr. Meyer? Yeah, just checking to make sure I didn't lose the mic. You still hear me okay? Oh, yeah, you're good. Yeah, okay, good. good. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's the go-to materialistic or atheistic explanation right now, and it has been uh, necessitated by precisely the incredible improbability of this ensemble of fine-tuning parameters, each of which are themselves um, improbably set, but then collectively uh, the improbability is just, again, almost beyond computation. And what the multiverse proposes as a, a way of explaining the improbability of the conditions that are necessary to allow for life is that there were millions and millions and billions and billions, I call them gabillions of other universes out there. <laughs> so many, in fact, that one of the universes must have by sheer chance alone stumbled upon the correct uh, fine tuning, the set of fine tuning parameters. Now there, there's, two very closely related problems with that assertion. The first is that th we have an improbable array of fine tuning parameters in our universe, and it does nothing to explain how that uh, improbable ensemble was set to posit other universes that are causally disconnected from our own. If there are other universes out there, well, great, but if they don't affect anything that, or uh, happens in this universe, then they can't be invoked as an explanation for how the fine-tuning parameters were set. They don't, they don't affect anything, including the probability of the fine-tuning parameters. In virtue of that, a multiverse explanations, partly in virtue of that, multiverse proponents propose what are called universe-generating mechanisms. And that allows them to portray our universe as the lucky winner of a kind of cosmic lottery. If there's an underlying universe generating mechanism that's spitting out these different universes with some kind of regularity, according to some underlying rules of or laws of physics, then we can think of our universe as the lucky winner in a great cosmic lottery where we're just kind of pulling the slot machine until you finally get the all, all the lemons to come up across the stream and you get all the right parameters. Um, but that's where the real rub comes in because w there are there are two different uh, universe generating mechanisms that have been proposed. One to propose one class of fine tuning, another that allegedly explains another class of fine tuning. And it turns out you need them both, which complexifies the explanation quite a bit in the Occam's razor sentence, which is another problem with this. But the deeper problem is that even in theory, those universe generating mechanisms themselves must be finely tuned in order to have uh, to, to produce new universes. And so the, the multiverse hypothesis subtly presupposes prior unexplained fine tuning and brings you right back to where you started. There is no ultimate explanation for fine tuning in the multiverse. It's just pushed back out of view one generation. And yet we do know of a cause that produces fine tuning. What we mean by fine tuning is after all, an improbable arrangement of parameters that work together to achieve some functional end 
or to uh, or or to establish some set of functional to meet some set of functional requirements. We can think of a French recipe as a finely tuned system. An internal combustion engine is a finely tuned system. Um, software and hardware working together creates a finely tuned system. So when we know uh, when we when when we use the concept of fine tuning to describe the way an overall system works, invariably the systems we're describing are intelligently designed. <laughs> and so it, if the multiverse doesn't provide an ultimate explanation for fine tuning, that leaves still only one satisfactory explanation. And that is again, intelligent design. So I think even if the multiverse is true, then we still have evidence of intelligent design in the universe making life possible. I think that is absolutely a really interesting as well, but also, yeah, it gets you right back to where you started. And, you know, I listened to another interview you had done and you said you had, I, think, I believe you were in a cab with someone who had left the theistic perspective and moved over to more atheistic perspective. And he was using the multiverse with you. And I think you said, you asked him, well, do you believe in the multiverse? He's like, uh, no. <laughs> well, it, yeah, it, there's a conversation I had with Michael Shermer, who's, I, oh, you know, okay. I would consider something of a friend. He's on the other side of the argument, but we've just always had a very cordial discussion about these things. He's the editor of Skeptic Magazine, and uh, I um, did a uh, a long interview with him on his podcast, and we, we had a really good discussion. He's a great guy. And uh, we did a debate at uh, Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri, several years ago, the, the college where... Uh, Winston Churchill famously gave the, the Iron Curtain speech. I don't think our debate will will be as famous in history, but anyway, <laughs> it was uh, it was a fun evening. And on the way back to the airport, uh, we were talking a bit more candidly, just one on one. And I asked him, "Well, you, you know, he, uh, how did he?" Well, he always starts his debates with his deconversion from Christianity story and how he became an atheist. And I asked him, "Well, wh what was it about science that?" Let, led to that and, and or what what led you to that 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 change of mind and he said well it was basically science and i said well what about science and he said well you know science all the big things it's discovered and its success uh, the dna and the big bang and you know and so i said well wait a minute you know i i accept all those same things we we theists celebrate those discoveries too but and he had already acknowledged in I'm not sure if it was that evening or a previous debate that he didn't have an explanation for the origin of the information that is necessary to produce life. And I said, so DNA is, you know, when we think about its origin, that, that's actually not a, that doesn't support atheism. It seems to support intelligent design of some kind. And he said, yeah, but, the, you know, then there's, you know, then there's, the, uh, you know, other things that science has discovered. And I asked him about um, the Big Bang and the origin of the universe and, the, the fine tuning. And he says, well, you know, but there's the multiverse. And I said, yeah, but do you believe that? Michael, he said, well, nah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and he's, his, his magazine, skeptic magazine has recently run a skeptical article about uh, the multiverse hypothesis written by the very prominent uh, astrophysicist from the university of California, San Diego, uh, Brian Keating. So um, I, and it's interesting in the response to my book so far, I have had very little pushback on the key arguments. And I think one of the reasons for that is that, that the go-to atheistic argument is the multiverse. And when you actually put it under critical examination, I don't think there are a lot of physicists who really want to defend it. I think that's wonderful. And and, and I think it leads us right into the the first one. And we've gone, we've gone back in order uh, from one, two, three. We're going three, two, one. So we've left, we've left hopefully the best uh, for last here in terms of the discovery that works so well in your book, The Return of the God Hypothesis. Well, right. And I, I went backwards just in our conversation because we had started by talking about, uh, in some ways, the inspiration for this particular book. And I wanted to address the question of the identity of the designing intelligence, understanding that there were at least two, and as I unpack in the book more than two possible explanations for the source of the intelligence responsible for life. One is the alien designer hypothesis, and the other is a deistic creator. And then finally, there's a theistic creator. And um, in addition to the evidence of the fine tuning, which is present from the very beginning of the universe, we also have evidence for the universe having had a beginning.
And uh, there are multiple lines of that evidence. The first kind of main line of evidence came from observational astronomy in the 19 teens and 20s, about 100 years ago, when astronomers began to detect that the light coming from distant nebular objects, later called galaxies, was being stretched out as if those distant galaxies were moving away from us and causing the wavelengths of light to, to stretch. Uh, this is a phenomenon in, uh, in physics known as uh, Doppler shift or redshift, specifically in astrophysics. And the idea is there is if you shine light through a prism, it separates into the different colors, red to violet. The red light is the has light that is light that has longer wavelengths. So if the if the, an object in the night sky is receding away from us, the light will look redder than it would otherwise look if the object were stationary in relation to us. And as astrophysicists began to survey the night sky, they discovered that in every quadrant of the night sky, that light coming from these distant galaxies was being red was red shifted. And that suggested that the universe itself, that the, the galaxies were moving away from us, but since they were in every direction moving away, that suggested that the universe was expanding something like a balloon and uh, kind of in a, a, a spherically symmetric expansion. And that in turn raised a really interesting possibility because if you think about an expanding universe in the forward direction of time, but then back extrapolate in your mind's eye as to what the universe would have been like at any successive point in the finite you, past, the universe would have been getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until finally the, the matter and energy would have uh, been, would have reached a point of convergence past which you couldn't back extrapolate any further. In other words, marking the beginning of the expansion of the universe and arguably the beginning of the universe itself. So that was the, the first big discovery in, in, uh, in astronomy and astrophysics that pointed to a beginning. There were additional discoveries, which I describe in the book, something called the cosmic background radiation and uh, developments in theoretical physics. Einstein's theory of general relativity, his new theory of gravity, which he developed in the 19 teens, um, implied that massive bodies cause the curvature of space and that the cause space it's suggesting curved. that if gravity were the only force at work in the universe, we should live in something like a black hole. But since we don't, there must be a contrary force pushing outward, causing the creation of space between massive bodies, which we see all around us. We have empty space around the earth and our solar system. So there must be an outward pushing force that implied a dynamic universe from uh, where the universe is expanding outward from a beginning. Einstein didn't like that initially, attempted to gerrymander his own e equations to kind of uh, conceal that implication, and then later realized that that was a huge mistake and came to accept that the universe did in fact have a beginning. So uh, multiple lines of evidence is a fascinating story, the stories of discovery, because this, this is a debate that goes back to the ancient Greeks. Is the universe eternal and self-existent? Or did it have a beginning and was it the product of an external creator? And modern physics, astrophysics, and astronomy, I think, are pointing toward the latter, the latter answer. And that's, so that's the third big discovery. And then to put the whole thing in context, uh, if after my first two books, I made the case that there's evidence of design in the information-bearing properties of living systems, but didn't attempt to identify whether the designer was an imminent intelligence within the cosmos or a transcendent intelligence, but when you bring in the evidence from physics and cosmology, which was some of the new aspects that I addressed in the book, it's clear that no alien intelligence within the cosmos could be responsible for the fine tuning of the universe that was present from very soon after its beginning, which in turn made its own life and, and, and uh, supposed evolution possible. In other, in other words, if the alien intelligence has to evolve from an, a simple cell on some other in some other planetary system in some other star system, uh, that would all happen long after the beginning of the universe and long after the fine tuning of the universe was set. So no alien intelligence could be responsible for the fine tuning of the very fabric of the universe as a whole that was set long before it came on the scene. And in addition, no alien intelligence could be responsible for the origin of the universe itself. That would require a transcendent cause and the fine tuning would require a transcendent intelligence. And so that suggests 
those two pieces of evidence suggest an intelligence which is not imminent within the cosmos, but rather transcends it and transcends the cosmos as a whole. In other words, God. Then the other question is, well, is the God uh, a deistic style creator that only sets things in motion at the beginning, but doesn't act afterwards? Or is that God more of a theistic creator who is transcendent and, and intelligent and therefore personal, but does that God also act in the creation long after the beginning? And I think the evidence of we, that we have of design and biology suggests that the, the need for that type of creator in order to explain the whole range of evidence that we have. That, and that's the argument of the book is that a theistic conception of God best explains the three key pieces of evidence we have about biological and cosmological origins, better than deism, better than the space alien hypothesis, and certainly better than materialism, which explains none of these three evidences adequately at all. That is absolutely amazing. And I only have about four minutes left with you, but I want to try to combine the last two questions that I wanted to ask you, especially after hearing all of that evidence. And we've been sitting here talking for almost an hour regarding the return of the God hypothesis. And what we've talked about is literally scratching the surface as to how much information he has in this book. So I want you guys to please check that out because it is amazing. And I think it kind of is the reason why I want to ask this question as kind of a finish and follow up to what we've been talking about the last hour, just under an hour. And that is how accepted today in the scientific field is neo-Darwinianism? And do you believe in the scientific field that there will be a major push away from atheism and over to the theistic side? Well, there is certainly already a major push away from the acceptance of neo-Darwinism. There was in 2016, a conference held at the Royal Society in London, uh, the Royal Society being the world's oldest and arguably most august scientific body. And the, the conference was convened by a number of leading evolutionary biologists who are dissatisfied with neo-Darwinism and who doubt that its main mechanism of creativity, namely the mutation selection mechanism, really has genuine creative power. It does a nice job of explaining small scale variations, uh, but a very poor job of explaining large morphological innovations, innovations in form that arise abruptly in the history of life. And the opening talk of that conference by leading Austrian uh, evolutionary biologist, Gerd Muller, enumerated what he called the explanatory deficits of neo-Darwinism. And the, the, the chief deficits pertain to the lack of creative power associated with the mutation selection mechanism. And so the purpose of the conference was to look for new evolutionary mechanisms that could either replace or supplement the, the, uh, the limited creative power of the main evolutionary mechanism. Uh, after the conference, one of the conveners of the conference described the outcome of the conference uh, or characterized the outcome for its, what she called lack of momentousness. Essentially, people did a great job of characterizing the problems with standard evolutionary theory, but really did not have anything world-shaking uh, or, uh, or of great significance or consequence to offer to solve the problems that they had convened the conference to address. Now, I address all of these issues in my second book, uh, Darwin's Doubt. And it's about, uh, the, the subtitle of that book is The Origin of Animal Life and uh, the, the uh, Abrupt Origin of Animal Life um, and the Case for Intelligent Design. And it, it's looking at the problem of the origin of new biological form and what's required to produce it. In particular, the informational requirements required to, uh, for, for new life. We know in our computer world, if you want to give your computer a new function, you have to give it new code. You have to give it new information. The same thing turns out to be true in the history of life. To explain the origin of new forms of life, there has to be an explanation for the origin of the information that allows those life forms to come into existence. And that's that's the key problem. And it hasn't been solved by modern neo-Darwinism or other post-neo-Darwinian theories of evolution. But I, I will tell you, in the, in the specialized field of evolutionary biology, there is increasing recognition that the neo-Darwinian approach is not adequate and something new is needed. Praise the Lord. I'm so excited. And I thank you guys so much. First, I have obviously have to thank Dr. Stephen Meyer for coming on and, and sharing with us so much from your book and also just from your own experiences as well and, and sharing with our audience all these different evidences and, and great reasons to believe in a creator that created this universe 
Ex Nihilo, Out of Nothing. And so I wanted to thank you so much for joining us on the Good Fight Radio Show, Dr. Meyer. And I want to thank you guys for coming along and watching this with us. And I want to encourage you, we'll have a link in the description to not only this book, but also the two other books that he mentioned that he also wrote, as well as Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. So thank you, Dr. Meyer, and thank you guys for listening. God bless. And this has been Chad Davidson on the Good Fight Radio Show. Thank you, Chad.